Welcome to the AZ Political Podcast. I'm Jim Sharp. Our headlines this week, headline number one, Arizona's 1864 law that banned most abortions in Arizona was repealed after two Republican state senators joined the Democratic caucus in approving a repeal bill that passed the state house the week before. Headline number two, ASU, the University of Arizona, and my alum not... Uh, Northern Arizona University are just some of the campuses across the country where police removed pro-Palestinian, or if you prefer, anti-Israeli encampments. Chuck Todd told me last week that the Biden campaign cannot wait until school's out. And headline number three, a new Emerson College poll shows that the Senate race in Arizona appears to be pretty neck and neck between Democrat Ruben Gallego and Republican Carrie Lake and shows that immigration is the top issue for Arizona voters by a big margin. All right. My guest this week is Kimberly Yee, who as state treasurer is the highest ranking Republican in state government. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Being the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants, she has a fascinating family history as well as a compelling personal history. In 2018, Treasurer Yee became the first Asian American elected to statewide office in Arizona's history and the first Chinese American Republican woman to be elected to a major statewide office in U.S. history. Wow. And she won re-election as a Republican in 2022, uh, a year that saw Democrats capture the governor's office, the attorney general's office and the secretary of state's office. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, I I want to talk about what lessons Republicans running in 2024 can can learn from your 2022 campaign and and why you decided to get into public service. But first, I, I do need to ask your reaction as the top Republican elected official in Arizona um, to the repeal of the 1864 law and as a former state legislator, how you think this might affect the races this fall? Well, the, the races in both parties are going to be very heated, as you can imagine. Right. I mean, if it's starting the year like this, mm-hmm. um, and Arizona is a swing state, so the eyes are on Arizona. And we will have multiple primaries to look at first, and then, of course, the general election. Um, what we saw in some of the activities happening in the legislative process, um, I could say a lot of things. I mean, having been a member of the legislature, um, um, having been the Republican majority leader in that period of time, right, right. I saw a lot of, I guess, what we would normally call as protocol um, not put in place and a respect for the institution. And it's, you know, all of the things that you have in place with respect to how you treat another member, how you dialogue on the floor. All of those things to me have really changed a great deal in a short period of time. And I, I hope that we get back to civil discourse, respect for others, no matter what their their points of views are. I mean, you know, when I served, I served in the halls of the state capitol, not only as a member elected from my legislative district, but way back when in the 90s, I actually was a staff member of the legislature. And and we had wonderful dialogue of things you might not agree on all the time. But that was the style of leadership. And you brought people, you intentionally brought people to the table that may not agree with your ideas, but it was for the better with respect to the long run of those laws. And and so as I represented my legislative district in Northwest Phoenix, it was the place where I was born and raised. And and there was there was one bill, you know, that was brought to my desk and it said, well, you know, why don't we put parking uh, parking spaces in various schools and charge for each parking space? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't really love the idea because, well, it, it probably would have affected uh, those North Scottsdale schools well with some extra dollars because right. they have kids who bring cars to school and, and the land that allows for those cars to be parked. But what happens to the South Phoenix school, you know, where they are landlocked? They don't have the space and capacity to build more parking spots for those kids. And what kids are going to bring, you know, the cars to school? Not as many as the North Scottsdale School District. And so it was one of those bills where it was not even uh, and it was not necessarily fair. Um, And the question I was asked, well, you live in North Phoenix. Why would you not like this idea? You have the capacity to have more money for your schools. And I said, well... 
I represent the whole state of Arizona because every law will affect every single family. And so really, even as a, a legislator in one part of Arizona, I you have to think through all of these bills that are carried through in a way that is meaningful for the entire state and the outcome for all families. And, and not just what's best for your party or your party's platform? Well, you have to take a look at the long-term vision. And I say that, you know, I, I deal with money in my job as state treasurer, so right. I'm not focused on every single bill at the legislature anymore. But um, when we take a long-term vision of Arizona, it is a growing state. We need to look at pro-growth policies. We need to look at the fact that we've got a lot of families coming here and they need the things that a family needs. You've got to have security. You have to have jobs. You have to have a great education system. All of those things are what I talked about in my 2022 re-election campaign for state treasurer. Those are those kitchen table items. It didn't change from the time when I was running in the legislature. Those are principled issues that I believe in strongly, and I, I think that they are ones that the average American family wants to talk about. Way back when in the 2010s, you mean? Way back when in the 2010s. <laughs> in fact, I, I actually I, I ran in a district that was very much a swing district right. back then. So it was evenly divided between Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And look at our state today. Yeah. And so I, I had a winning message, I believe, in 2010 when I ran for the state house, um, and, and it showed to be true in 2022 running statewide. And State Senator Shauna Bullock is in one of those swing districts now, uh, one of the Republicans that crossed the aisle to vote for this repeal of the 1864 law. Did it bother you? Um, you know, you have a lot of respect for the history of the legislature and, and, and all the mechanisms that go along with it. Uh, did it bother you over the last few weeks to see, you know, members of uh, the state house or state senate standing and chanting, uh, yelling at each other? Um, you know, the things that you don't really, you know, put, put in the, de the decorum it should, column. It should be a place of decorum. Yeah. Great respect for the institution. And I've seen such great, unfortunate changes uh, in not just these last couple of weeks. Right. Um, it's actually been changing rapidly. And it's very difficult for me to even sometimes watch a committee hearing um, because I see you know, one party talking to another party as if, you know, they don't matter. Um, everybody matters. Everybody has a voice and, and they are duly elected to represent that legislative district. Um, whether you agree with them or not, mm -hmm. let them have their say, but don't treat them with disrespect. Do you, do you think that's a result of the entire national political atmosphere? I would hope not. I, I do feel that there should be, you know, discipline um, in, in the way a person, you know, um, carries themselves as an elected official for their constituents. Uh, and, and we have to be very mindful as voters of who we elect. And, and as people who are running as candidates, they have to have that discipline on the campaign trail as well. So I think that we are seeing a great a great level of partisanship enter the halls of the state capitol even after campaign season. And I, I will share with you a story that, uh, a special story. When I was the majority leader in the state Senate, um, I was the second female majority leader to ever serve in Arizona as majority leader. The first being Sandra Day O'Connor. Oh, right, right. Her right. picture is out in the, in the lobby out yes, there. Yeah. And Sandra Day O'Connor was not only the first female to serve on the highest court in our country's history, but the first female uh, majority leader of any state. And it was in 1973 that she served as majority leader in Arizona. Yeah. And so I asked her to be my guest in 2017 to talk about the importance of civics education, because that was something she greatly, you know, took to after her retirement. So. We shared some time at my majority leader desk on the floor of the state Senate, which was her former majority leader desk, yeah, 44 yeah. years prior. Oh, that's so cool. And I asked her, Justice, what was it like when you served 44 years ago in this very chamber as the majority leader? And she says, well, take a look at all of the desks that you see here. You have the Republicans who decorate their desks with elephants, and then you have the Democrats decorate their desks with donkeys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they do that because kids come into tours and they want 
want to see what the parties are. Well, she says back in that time and place where she served on that very Senate floor, they did not pay any attention to party affiliation. They just went into work to get the good work done for the people of Arizona. And that was just so memorable for me. And I share that story over and over across the state because we need to get back to that place of going to work to get the good work done for the people of Arizona. Leave that partisanship behind on the campaign trail. Sure, it's needed to get elected. But when you go into work, it's about the laws that you are making and about the laws that affect every family in Arizona. Maybe at least stop running for office for re-election in your first legislative term. <laughs> maybe, save, maybe save it for your second legislative term uh, when you're politicking on the floor. Right. Uh, well, yeah. that's yeah. actually not allowed either. <laughs> right, <laughs> but yeah. uh, save it for the campaign trail. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about something that, that, that's in the headlines that does directly impact your office. So these campus protests mm. against America's alliance with Israel often includes demands to uh, disinvest. Has there been any pressure on you or your office to divest anything that the state of Arizona has invested with Israeli companies or interests? Well, Arizona was one of the first states in the country to have anti-boycott divestment and sanctions laws on the book. Back in 2016, I was a member of the legislature. The, the legislature passed a law that says that the state of Arizona cannot do business with any companies that boycott Israel. Mm. And in, in this particular law, I was able to actually put that in action as the state treasurer in 2021. We saw that uh, Ben and Jerry's was boycotting Israel and that West Bank area. And so when we saw that they were moving in the boycott area, it was going to affect and trigger that law that we had on the books since 2016. So I contacted Ben and Jerry's pa parent company, Unilever, and said, you have two options. I will give you one. You can either change your course of action um, and go back and sell ice cream in Israel, or you can divest your relationship from Ben and Jerry's, which is doing this action. And they chose to do nothing. So we divested $143 million from Unilever, Ben and Jerry's, uh, at that moment to zero. Mm. So we actually divested from uh, a company that was really going in a woke direction. Um, we clearly saw that there was triggering of that 2016 law. I um, got a call about a year later from Unilever and they said, Treasurer Yi, would you consider reinvesting with us again? Um, five other states had followed after Arizona, by the way. So we were the leader in a divestment movement. Um, Texas, New Jersey, Florida, New York. Uh, we really saw that there was a movement of taking a stance on those um, types of corporations that were moving in this direction of, of, of boycotting Israel, which Arizona has a long standing partnership and trade um, you know, relationship with in Israel. So, so we stood on that. And uh, it was so interesting because when Unilever called me about a year later, they said, would you reconsider investing? And I said, well, wait a second, what took you so long? But the second thing I said was, um, you know, your uh, your actions are showing that you are continuing to boycott. Well, they said, well, we're going to actually uh, change our course of action. And we they had sold their subsidiary the, um, in in the West Bank to a, an Israeli manufacturer. Oh. So Ben and Jerry's was no longer gotcha. manufacturing the ice cream there. So that was good news um, from that perspective. But we will uh, still take a look at what they're doing with Ben and Jerry's on the domestic side. D does that law extend to where the universities, the state universities yes. invest? Well, because so that's following... One of, the, one of the demands is that ASU divest from any right. really, uh, you know, investments. Following that uh, particular year, 2021, uh, so many of the groups, you know, said thank you for doing that. It really put a hard stance on where we were on in terms of our um, Arizona f financials. And so we actually went to the legislature uh, with those uh, groups and we said, you also need to put this on the books for local entities that deal with taxpayer dollars in Arizona, meaning if you're a local government, a school district, uh, even a university, all of those are now in play with respect to um, their ability to divest from companies that are boycotting Israel. Very interesting. All right. I, I'm glad I asked this. You're welcome. I, I had no idea. Um, let's talk about you for a little bit here. Uh, and let's start with some full disclosure. Okay. Um, my family's relationship to you. Uh, my wife is a walking anomaly. She's a Republican school teacher who grew up in Massachusetts. How many of those are there? Um, she met you when you served in the state legislature, and she was really drawn to you for a couple of reasons. First off, 
your support for public education um, and that, you know, she's fascinated that you're a Republican woman of color. Was it your family that led to you? getting these conservative ideals that you have? My family has been in Arizona since the 1930s. And uh, my mother comes from a family of nine children. And they had a little grocery store on the corner of 7th Avenue and Buckeye Road in South Phoenix. And it stood on that same corner for 63 years. All of those nine children worked in the store. They stocked the store shelves. They took inventory. All of the things that you do in a family-run business. Um, But one of the things that my grandparents shared with them when they were young, those nine children, was the value of education and really being able to have that so that you can do whatever you'd like to do. And um, and so out of those nine children, about five of them went into public school education, one of them being my mother, who taught oh. as a first and second grade teacher for 38 years um, right here in Phoenix. And, and so that love for public education has been true, um, not only just because that's what we talked about around the table, you know, all of my childhood, but really it's, it's about being able to have that understanding of what makes, um, you know, life great in this state and having a great um, business that we ran for so many years. It was called New State Market, by the way, because Mm -hmm. not only was Arizona a new state back in the 1930s, (laughs) but it was a new state for opportunity for my family and being able to have that wonderful freedom to be able to open something from scratch and make that work for over six decades. Um, On the other side of the country, my father was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So another Eastern, uh, you know, um, family. And so it was interesting because they had a hand laundry business in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh. Wow. And my grandfather, uh, you know, he ran that morning till night, of course, and then uh, took the night shift and worked as a welder for World War II on uh, U.S. naval ships. Uh, So, you know, you're working around the clock. This is the work ethic that you understand. But when my grandparents moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Arizona, when I was a little girl, I had the blessing of of living with them um, because they came to move in with us. And, And in Asian American families, the eldest son has that great responsibility of taking care of the elder parents. So my dad being the eldest, um, he took in my grandparents. And one of the earliest memories I have is with my grandfather um, sitting next to him, watching the Republican National Convention faithfully every four years. Mm. And we, we sat in front of the television. My grandfather would bring um, in the family camera, take pictures of his favorite speakers. And we still have those photos in the family album, by the way. And as a little girl, I didn't fully understand the the content of those speeches. But I saw that the red, white, and blue balloons coming down from the ceiling, um, that was a celebration of freedom. That was really an understanding that we live in a great country. And and being able to see, you know, my grandfather be so engaged with the news. He would watch it day and night, literally, when he was retired. We He read the newspaper front to back. Um, Remember when there was a PM paper? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would walk... (laughs) Yes. I would walk with him to Yellow Front store. I don't know if you remember that. And um, we would walk down the block and he would give me two quarters and I would put those in and I'd pull out the PM paper. He would read it front to back. Again, watch the television news. All of that showed me as a little girl that it mattered who we elected to these leadership positions because those laws affected the everyday family and business owner. And so I, I do feel that in in early years of just growing up in a family that worked very hard uh, in in business and in just engaging in the community, it taught me the value of, of who we elect um, and really being able to work hard to be that voice, you know, uh, to our communities and to represent families. So let's talk about getting elected. Yeah. Um, in 2022. Um, you went against the grain in winning your statewide race as a Republican, as I already mentioned, you know, in 2022, um, governor, attorney general, secretary of state all went to Democrats. For the first time in a long, long time mm-hmm. in the state. Um, what would you like Republicans in 2024 to learn from what you did in 2022? Well, I ran a very disciplined campaign and I stayed on point uh, to those very kitchen table issues that we talked about earlier. And that's my style. Who, people who know me know that I want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about education and it being better, as well as just ensuring that our security and safety is really something you know we've got to keep apprised of, not only as a southern state, but also our local communities are dealing with law enforcement issues where they're decreasing their funding 
spending yeah. um, city and town by town. And, and that really matters to the average family. In fact, I went straight to the very voters that I knew I needed. Uh, they were the independent, um, educated, college educated woman and business owner. And I spoke to groups. I asked them, what's your number one priority? Mm -hmm. And back in 2018, when I was first elected as state treasurer in a statewide race, they would have said the economy. Right. So I, sh I couldn't have assumed that, you know, four years later, and I didn't. So I asked them again, what's your number one priority? And do you know what they said? What? Security. Security. These were post uh, riots that were happening around right. Fashion Square yep. Mall. Yep. And Summer. remember, this is where they had um, immigration related issues in their neighborhoods uh, because they were putting them in the Holiday Inn nearby uh, their neighborhoods. And it was interesting to see that things had changed in terms of their top priorities over those four years. But the most important thing was being disciplined in what I talked about. And, and I didn't change what I talked about from the primary to what I talked about in the general. And I really took that back to 2010 when I was running for office for the very first time in that swing district in Northwest Phoenix. I walked those neighborhoods like you can't imagine. I knew every single street by name. I had grown up in that very neighborhood. And the average campaigner probably goes to the households that are registered in their party. Right, right. It's an easier knock, right? Because yeah, when they open the door, what you are can. You doing in my <laughs> right? Get out of here. And you know what? I was a former Girl Scout, and I, I've <laughs> knocked on a lot of doors, and I sell cookies, and I don't care what party affiliation you're. I just want your, you know, right. at that time, your cookie sale, but okay. at this time, I just want your vote. I don't care what party affiliation you are. I want you to get to know who I am and what I stand for. And it's a harder way to campaign, but that's how I did it and how I will continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and I I saw that the results showed that that really mattered because if you take a look at all of the election results, I received 80% of the Mojave County vote. Wow. I received more votes than registered Republicans in Yavapai County. And so it really does show that there were crossover voters to uh, my win. I received independent voters uh, confidence as well as probably some fiscal Democrats that were out there who like where their money is yeah. and, and people who really trust the candidate who see that integrity and honesty actually matter. So are you going to take the lessons that you have learned and put them to use, uh, your term limited out, uh, in, in 2026, are you going to try another run at governor or what's, what's your political future? I have been asked to uh, very seriously consider what that. What you're saying is this is not an original <laughs> question. Uh, and I, I, I really appreciate it because I go statewide and I speak and, yeah. and that is the question I get. Right. Um, and I, I do feel that I fight uh, for, you know, our values and the things that matter to Arizona and making the state, you know, really wonderful. The wonderful state that my grandparents saw in it back in the 1930s. And so I, I really would love to continue continue to work for the great state of Arizona and its people. And so in 2026, um, you know, I'll make a decision. Um, but that term is up and I unfortunately will have to, you know, um, bring this office and the state treasurer's office to someone else's wonderful hands. But I do feel that there is a great need for good leaders in, in every capacity in the state, really. Um, but from a statewide perspective, I, I do love the work and I love to be able to bring people together and, and really talk about the issues that matter. And maybe possibly expand our already record holding number of female governors we've had. We've had some really strong numbers on that side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 I always love pointing to this because you know so many people around the country love to point at Arizona and act like we're some ridiculously bigoted state. And uh, especially when 1070 passed a few years ago, right? Uh, that immigration law. Um, but look at us, you know, we have elected plenty of women to high positions, uh, women of color. Um, we've, uh, you know, we elected the first openly bisexual member of the U.S. Senate <laughs> from Arizona. Doesn't sound very bigoted. I'd like to show people across the country that Arizona is a great state. And I think that they are seeing that because when they come in the numbers that they're coming, they are wanting to live here for a long time. And so we, we want to continue to have that reputation of bringing people 
to uh, the great state of Arizona. We've got wonderful things to offer. So what date should I invite you back so you can tell me exactly <laughs> what office you're going to run for? We'll see. Uh, I thought I might be able to get that out. <laughs> thank or, you. Okay. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've talked on the phone before, yes. but we've never met in person. Right. Uh, now I understand my wife's fascination with you. Say so. hi to Karen for me. I will. And the girls. I will. I will. <laughs> I will. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, Arizona State Treasurer Kimberly Yee.